it should be easy to build these diverse democracies. We should all be able to get along. How hard is it to be nice to each other? How hard is it not to hate your neighbor just because they're somehow different from you? Thanks very much, Sergio. Uh, it's a great pleasure to co-host this event with you this evening. And I must thank the Toronto chapter of the Canadian International Council for co-sponsoring this event. It's a real privilege to introduce our speaker this evening, Dr. Yasha Munk, and the subject of his talk, Why Democracies Have Struggled to Treat All Their Citizens Equally and Fairly, Regardless of Their Ethnic and Racial Identities, Their Cultural Roots, and How They Can Do So in the 21st Century. Historically, many democracies, as we know, have embraced an ethnic conception of the nation state to protect a specific definition of the people, creating relatively homogenous societies, often through violence. Others have constitutionally espoused a form of civic patriotism. Yet in practice, they reveal structures of hierarchy, fragmentation, and exclusion. Never has a democracy succeeded in being diverse, equal, and fair to all its citizens. Our guest this evening is widely known for his work on the crisis of democracy and the defense of liberalism. Born in Germany to Polish parents, Dr. Munk received his BA in history from Trinity College, Cambridge, and a PhD in government from Harvard University, where he began his teaching career. Today, he's an associate professor of the practice of international affairs at Johns Hopkins University, where he holds appointments at the School for Advanced International Studies and the SNF Agora Institute. A leading public intellectual who wears many hats and never seems to sleep, Yasha is a contributing editor for The Atlantic, a senior fellow at the Council of Foreign Relations. He's also the founder of Persuasion, a platform dedicated to free inquiry and open debate, and the host of a podcast many of you probably listen to, The Good Fight. And he regularly writes for major newspapers and magazines around the world, from The New York Times and The Wall Street Journal to DZIT, I'm sure I've mispronounced that, La Repubblica and El Pai, amongst others. Yasha is the author of four books, which have been translated into over 10 languages. Stranger in My Own Country is a personal memoir about what did it means to be Jewish in post-war Germany under the shadow of the Third Reich. The Age of Responsibility, an essay in intellectual history and moral philosophy, examines the grave effects the cult of personal responsibility had on public policy in Western democracies since the 1970s. And the people versus democracy charts the causes and consequences of the global rise of populism over the last decade, winning critical acclaim and wide influence. The subject of Yasha's talk this evening is his newest work, The Great Experiment, Why Diverse Democracies Fall Apart and How They Can Endure. It asks three major questions. Why do diverse societies struggle to last? What ethical principles can they help, can help us craft diverse democracies? And what policies should we pursue and which ones should we avoid in order to succeed? Yasha will speak for roughly 30 minutes. He and I will then begin a conversation to explore some of the themes and arguments in his book before opening it up to your questions and comments. Please join me in welcoming Yasha Monk. Uh, thank you very much for this generous introduction. Um, this is my, my third time in this wonderful room in the, in the Toronto Public Library. I've come to be very fond of it. Um, and I've come to be very fond of Toronto. And as I've been walking around the city today, I was thinking that it really is a very appropriate place to talk about the subject uh, uh, of my book. Uh, because uh, it is both one of the many places uh, in which the stakes of the books are very present, but also one of the places that really makes me optimistic about our ability to uh, succeed in what I call the great experiment, in the great transformation of uh, our democracies around the world. Um, so I started to think about this uh, topic a few years ago when I was promoting my last book, The People vs. Democracy, which was about the rise of populism and the threat it poses to liberal democracies around the world. And I was 
in Germany on uh, one of the main uh, German uh, news shows called Tagesthemen on German public uh, uh, television. Uh, and I was a little bit nervous because uh, I'm much more used at this point to uh, giving interviews in, in English. I, I give interviews in Italian and French as well, but if I make a mistake there, it's sort of obvious I'm a foreigner. But I, I was born and raised in Germany. Um, and so if I somehow misspeak, it's particularly embarrassing. Um, and so uh, I was a little bit nervous, and the host of this television show asked me to talk about the causes for the rise of populism. And that was good, because it was a straightforward question. That was a lot of what my book was about. Uh, and so I said it had to do with uh, the economic stagnation of living standards for ordinary citizens. It had to do with the rise of the internet and of social media and the way that that makes it easier for extremists to organize and to spread uh, lies and hatred uh, uh, to people. And I said that finally it had to do with uh, a great experiment uh, that we're in the middle of, that of turning mono-ethnic and monocultural societies into multi-ethnic ones. Uh, that creates real problems and real challenges. It could go badly wrong, but I think that in the end, it's going to succeed. Um, she asked me a couple more questions. I was a lot less nervous at that point. I felt that it went very well. Um, I got off the air. My mom, who is, uh, watches every German interview I gave uh, and normally criticizes every word I say, uh, called me and said, that, that went great, that was amazing. And I went, okay, wonderful. I went to an airport hotel, fell asleep, took the plane to the United States the next day. Uh, and when I landed uh, and switched on my phone, I had a lot of notifications. And I don't know if that's ever happened to you, but if you haven't looked at your phone for a while and you look at it and suddenly there's way more notifications than there should be, that's usually a bad sign. <laughs> and so I look at them and it turns out that this phrase of a great experiment had gone viral. It started out of a couple of right-wing blogs in Germany and then some politicians for the alternative for Germany for this kind of far-right populist party had picked it up and then it had made its way to uh, nice international publications like the Daily Stormer, the uh, neo-Nazi website. And what they all said is that, uh, I was teaching at Harvard at the time, that you know, I, Harvard academic, Harvard Jew, you know, Jewish Harvard academic Yasha Munk admits that he's experimenting on the German people in cahoots with Angela Merkel. Um, so I thought, okay, this phrase, the great experiment, which I'd used without thinking about it much, it came out in that moment. Did I say something wrong? Was that a mistake? Um, now, that term has two meanings, right? Uh, there's an experiment like you may have experienced when you were in high school when your chemistry teacher comes in and says, I'm going to do an experiment, and I'm going to, you know, put this one liquid into another liquid, and then there'll be an explosion. Um, and hopefully he knows what he's doing, and he had in mind exactly what was going to happen, and he didn't burn down your school building. Um, so that's one kind of experiment, right? The chemistry teacher performed an experiment for you with a goal of teaching you something and knowing exactly what the outcome was going to be. If he didn't, then he was taking a risk he shouldn't have. But there's also a second meaning of experiment when you look at the dictionary. It's what uh, uh, people in the United States mean when we talk about the uh, experiment of the American founding. And that is to embark on a course of action without knowing exactly what the outcome is. And often not because somebody has planned it all along, but because circumstances necessitated in embarking on that experiment. And that, I think, is much closer to the crux of what has happened in many democracies around the world, including Canada, including the United States, including Germany, and so many others over the last decades. Uh, roughly speaking, there were two kinds of democracies 30 or 40 years ago. Those democracies, like Canada and the United States, that have always been somewhat diverse, but which also had a very clear ethnic and religious hierarchy, which solved the challenges of diversity by saying, well, we're going to give the rights and uh, the power to this group, and everybody else has to listen to them. That's one simple solution, but it's not a very just solution. It's not a very appealing solution. And then there was many other societies, like many countries in Europe, like Germany, where I grew up, where at the moment of a successful founding of democracy, often after World War II, these societies, because of the 
uh, genocides and forms of ethnic cleansing of the first half of the 20th century had become very homogeneous. So we didn't have schemes of domination that were as extreme as that which reigned in the United States in the 19th century, for example. Um, but they uh, solved the problem by not having very much diversity. Now, as a result of uh, uh, immigration, often driven by policies that didn't really aim uh, to increase ethnic or religious diversity, which uh, politicians who passed those laws didn't even anticipate that that would be the result, uh, most democracies in the world have become deeply ethnically and religiously diverse. Canada today is a much more diverse country than it was 30 or 40 years ago. Sweden, Germany, Italy are much, much more diverse than they were 30 or 40 years ago. And so what all of those societies are now embarked upon is a great experiment, is something without real historical precedent. And that is to try and build these ethnically and religiously diverse democracies that actually treat all of the citizens as equals. It's not the reality we're in, but it's the aspiration that we have at this point in time. So that's the subject of my talk and our conversation today. It's to think through uh, how we can make sense of this historically unprecedented experiment, what the stakes of it are, and how it can succeed. And I want to do two, three things in, in my talk before I look forward to, to my conversation uh, with Sanjay and, and to all of your questions. Uh, the first is to lay out why this is actually a difficult thing to do. Why there's very real reasons, why it's hard to sustain uh, and to make thrive these ethnically and religiously diverse democracies. The second is to argue for optimism about the extent to which we're succeeding, to say that actually we are doing rather better at this than it can sometimes seem and when a lot of people have concluded. And the third is to start talking a little bit about the kind of principles that can guide us, the kind of policies we should adopt in order to make sure that this great experiment succeeds. So, uh, in different terms, I'm going to aim to depress you a little bit for the first 10 minutes of the talk, but then make you a little bit less depressed by the end of it. All right. Um, what are the reasons why it is actually difficult to build and sustain diverse democracies? There's three big ones in my mind. And I get it the first one, uh, when I teach. Uh, I teach at Johns Hopkins University now, which is an incredibly diverse campus. Only about 20% of the incoming uh, class is white. Uh, and my students think of themselves as some of the most tolerant human beings on the face of the planet. And in some ways they are, in others perhaps not so much. Um, uh, but I challenge them. I, I ask them in one of my first lectures of a term uh, a rather strange question. I ask them, uh, do you believe that a hot dog is a sandwich? And they look at me a little confused. Um, but they like to argue, so eventually somebody says, no, I, I don't think it is, and they explain why it isn't. And somebody else says, no, of course it is, and they explain why they think it is. And then I have them vote. Um, and, and they sort of form these little groups, right? They form a group of people who believe that a hot dog is a sandwich, and a group of people who think that a hot dog is not a sandwich. And then I have them play a simple distribution game where they have to give points to each of those groups. And it turns out the people who think that a hot dog is a sandwich start to discriminate against the people who think that a hot dog is not a sandwich. They would rather give less money to themselves as long as it means that the others get even less money just to show it to those people who are wrong about whether or not a hot dog is a sandwich. And that expresses, uh, that sort of silly exercise expresses something quite deep and profound about human nature, which is that we are groupish. That human beings find it very easy to form groups, to say, hey, we find some kind of dimension that now defines who is part of my group and who is part of that group over there. And often, we are capable of impressive and extreme courage and altruism in defending and helping the members of our own groups. 
but we're also capable of terrible cruelty, of terrible disregard for members of that group over there. And that is the first difficulty of building diverse democracies. Now, when you look at the human record, when you look at the annals of humanity, um, sometimes uh, really terrible conflicts were structured by things that seem arbitrary in retrospect. I've studied history for my undergraduate degree, but I still cannot explain to you the difference between the Guelphs and the Ghibellines that warred against each other for centuries in medieval Italy. It, it, it feels very abstract to me when I try to understand what motivated them. So we can be driven by these very abstract ideological stakes. But, and this is the second reason why it's hard to build diverse democracies, when you look at history, most of the time, wars and civil wars, forms of genocide and ethnic cleansing, were driven by forms of ascriptive identity. We're driven by contestation over race, religion, ethnicity, perhaps language, perhaps nationality. We know that when human beings have been at the absolute worst, it often was motivated by those kinds of character traits. And so that raises the stake in a really diverse society because it just becomes easier for demagogues to say, hey, here's the dividing line. It's members of your ethnic group against members of that ethnic group over there. And that's the second difficulty we need to address. Now, the third difficulty is perhaps the most surprising one and perhaps the most paradoxical one. Um, I, I'm somebody who deeply believes in the values of liberal democracy. I'm somebody who believes that democratic institutions have helped humans to build the most thriving and affluent and tolerant societies um, uh, that have ever existed on this earth. Um, so I would think that democratic institutions are part of a solution. And I lay out in the book ways in which democratic institutions rightly understood and rightly constrained are parts of the solution. But in one really powerful way, democratic institutions actually make it more difficult for diverse societies to succeed. Because if you're in a dictatorship, or if you're in a monarchy, you don't have any political power, and I don't have any political power. So if you have more kids than I do, or there's more immigrants coming into a society who look like you rather than like me, it doesn't actually change my standing. I had to trust the monarch or the dictator to be tolerant towards me before, and I'll have to trust the monarch or the dictator to be tolerant towards me afterwards. It doesn't really change anything. Well, a democracy is, by definition, a mechanism which pushes you to search for a majority. The majority gets to make decisions. And so if I used to be in the majority along some salient lines of identity, if I was in the majority ethnic group and the majority religious group, and suddenly I've come to fear that you are having more children than I am, that there's more immigrants who look like you rather than like me, well, I might, have to, I might start to think, well, what happens when I'm in the minority? Perhaps all of the laws are gonna change. Perhaps all the rules are gonna change. Perhaps the power and the privilege that I hold today is going to be taken away from me, and that would be terrible. And you can see in the politics of many countries around the world, of many democracies around the world, how powerfully motivating that fear is for many people. It explains everything from uh, conspiracy theories of a great replacement to a kind of defensive identity politics that many people engage in. Uh, so these, I think, are three of the reasons why we need to take seriously the difficulty of building uh, diverse societies. Now, I hope that I've got you somewhat depressed at this stage. Uh, let me try and get you out of a depression. Because when I look at the sort of common wisdom about this topic, I find that we often start with an easy and a naive optimism and that pushes us towards fatalism. That when you start to think about this topic by saying, well, it should be easy to build these diverse democracies. We should all be able to get along. How hard is it to 
be nice to each other? How hard is it not to hate your neighbor just because they're somehow different from you? I understand where this is coming from, but it then pushes you to say, well, if we're imperfect, if there's discrimination in our society, if there's racism in our society, if there's these scary politicians getting elected, uh, you know, if we're failing at this really easy task, how can we possibly have hope? How can we possibly think that things are going to get better in the future? So paradoxically, if you start with this really naive, hopeful, optimistic starting point, it pushes you towards a really pessimistic conclusion. I make the opposite argument. I start with the reasons why what we're doing is really difficult. I point out in much more detail in the book when I can this talk, the ways in which diverse societies have historically gone wrong in terrible ways. But that, I think, allows us to look back at our reality today and to look back at the evolution of our societies over the last 100, 50, 25 years and recognize that we're doing pretty well, that we've made a lot of progress and that we can hope to make further progress by living up more fully to the ideals that guide our societies already. So let me make a couple of points that should speak to this kind of optimism. One that I find particularly striking is in the debate over immigration. That actually takes a relatively similar shape in uh, much of Europe, in much of North America, in Australia, and beyond. You have people on the far right who make a claim that goes something like the following. They say, the reason why our society has historically been successful is the dominance of a particular kind of ethnic and cultural group. Uh, now that there's immigrants coming in who come from different cultures, who have different ethnicities, uh, they don't share those traits. They are somehow culturally inferior, supposedly, or perhaps sometimes it's even uh, insinuated or said that they're biologically inferior. Uh, and so therefore they're not succeeding. Therefore uh, everything is going to go wrong. I'm sure you've heard these claims in politics, right? Um, now, ironically enough, many of my friends and colleagues who rightly disagree with that, who say that that is preposterous, echo the basic pessimism of that kind of description of immigration. They're saying, no, of course it is untrue that there's something inferior about the immigrants coming in. That is wrong. But immigrants can't really succeed in our society. They don't really succeed in our society because of the extent of discrimination and racism and disadvantage that they face. White immigrants 150 years ago may have been able to succeed, but the immigrants coming into our society today can't succeed in the same kind of way. Now, I was predisposed to believe some form of this, but when I started to look at the evidence, I was struck by the extent to which it points in a different direction. Because actually, when you start to look at what it was like 100 or 50 years ago when uh, Italian and Irish immigrants came to North America, for example. It took them a very long time to uh, earn as much as people who'd been in the country for a longer period of time. They often had less educational opportunities in the countries from which they came. They often arrived at a point in their lives uh, uh, where they were already you know, 20 or 30 or 35, um, and so often in that first generation, they did not reach median income in the new societies. But the children, the grandchildren, made real socioeconomic progress. And over time, it became a big success story. And that is precisely what is happening today in all of these societies. When you look at Western Europe, there's a great study from the OECD, which shows that the children and the grandchildren of immigrants are more likely to experience upward social mobility, upward educational mobility, than the children and the grandchildren of similarly situated non-immigrants. So the gap is closing rapidly. And when you look at a great study in the United States that looks at over a million data points, some of the uh, best uh, uh, economists at Princeton and Stanford and elsewhere, uh, they show that immigrants to the United States today from uh, uh, Mexico and El Salvador and Vietnam and Kenya and Nigeria and all kinds of other countries 
are rising with socioeconomic ranks at about the same speed as Italian and Irish immigrants did a century ago. So that gives the lie to the voices on the far right who claim that there's something inferior about this crop of immigrants. Clearly, if they're succeeding at the same speed, uh, there's nothing inferior about them. But it also gives the lie to the fashionable pessimism that many of my friends and colleagues often engage in. Yes, immigrants do uh, face unfair burdens. They do face discrimination and sometimes racism, and we have to fight against that. But evidently, they are able to overcome it, and they are actually succeeding to a remarkable degree. That is just one kind of element of the reasons why a sober reflection on our societies today allows us a kind of hard-won optimism. Um, there's other ways as well. Uh, one of them is the broadening notion of who truly belongs in a society. In many European societies, for example, 30 or 40 years ago, um, people uh, in the street, if you asked them who's a true German, who's a true Italian, who's a true uh, Dane, would have said, well, somebody whose grandparents and great-grandparents and great-great-grandparents were already living here, somebody who belongs to the same ethnic group. There's polls that show clearly that that was the majority view. Today, that is no longer the case. People recognize that both first-generation immigrants and, of course, their descendants can be true Germans, true Danes, true Italians, um, that you don't have to belong to the same ethnic group or uh, belong to the same religion as the majority of the population in order to be a true member of those societies. And one of the really striking things about all of this is that uh, uh, both immigrants and members of minority groups are often more optimistic and more patriotic than members of the majority group. So in the United States, for example, uh, both Latinos and African Americans are more likely to say that they believe in the American dream, more likely to say that they think the future is going to be better than the past than uh, members, uh, than, than white Americans. And so again, um, this is qualified optimism, there's a lot of work still ahead, but I think we can actually be proud of the improvements of the last decades and try and push for further improvements along the same lines. So let me move to um, a third uh, part of a talk. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about some of the basic rules and principles and policies which I think can help to build these diverse democracies, can help to sustain them. Now, as I said, I'm a believer in uh, liberal democracies, or sometimes people call it dem democratic republic, um, in political systems which are based on two fundamental values, on collective self-determination and on individual freedom. That, I think, is how we should be building our societies. And the fundamental promise of this is what philosophical uh, liberals talk about when we speak about freedom. It is a society in which members of minority groups are protected against the traditional pressures that uh, tyrannical states uh, impose on them. They are protected against a state which gangs up on its minorities, protected against a state that tries to oppress, uh, sometimes jail, sometimes murder members of unpopular minority groups. And they're also protected against social pressure. They're protected against the tyranny of majority. They know that they can go to the house of worship without having to be afraid that somebody is going to harm them or somebody's going to try to burn it down. That is a fundamental aspect of making sure that people can be their whole selves in these societies. But there's also a second freedom which is equally important. Dan Atsumoglu and James Robinson uh, point out in a recent book called The Narrow Corridor that traditionally one of the real threats to freedom has been what they call the cage of norms. Not the state, not the majority group outside of yourself that imposes on you how you have to live, but your own family, your own aunts and uncles, your own neighbors, your own priests and rabbis and imams who tell you this is how you have to live and if you won't then we're going to find ways 
to punish you. So what we need is a double freedom. It is a freedom that also ensures that when people want to leave their own communities, when they want to choose a romantic partner of whom the parents disapprove, when they want to uh, uh, choose a profession or move to a city that their family disapproves of, they're also capable of doing that. And that's why I think the principles of philosophical liberalism are what recognizes these twin demands of the dignity of groups and the freedom of individuals. Rightly understood, the principles of our society give you a right of free association, a, fr a right of free worship. Why? Because we recognize that for many people, the membership in groups is fundamentally important to their identity and how they want to lead their lives. But when groups within society start to be tyrannical towards their members, we as a society, and even the state has to step in because these groups are only worthy of our respect so long as we don't coerce their members. That, I think, is the right basic philosophical conception of our society. Let me move on to another related topic, which is about uh, the kind of uh, model for integration, uh, particularly of immigrants, that we should embrace. And there's two traditional metaphors which have helped to structure our thoughts in that respect. The first is the metaphor of uh, the melting pot, um, which when you read the original play on which it was based uh, actually has a real kind of moral force. There's actually something quite appealing about it. But in the way that it's been used, it has asked people to become too homogeneous. It has basically said that a good kind of society is going to be one in which we eat the same kinds of foods and we behave in the same kinds of ways um, and we're not very influenced by the kind of cultural heritage uh, we have. And that, I think, uh, both makes far too strong demands on uh, the extent to which people should give up their, their family traditions and so on, and I think uh, misses a lot of what's attractive about diverse societies and diverse cities. One of the things that's attractive about Toronto is that everything is not the same, but that you have neighborhoods that are influenced by different uh, cultures, different cuisines, and so on and so forth, right? Um, the second kind of model that uh, arose a little bit, uh, you know, in competition with uh, the melting pot, or as an answer to the melting pot, was the idea of a salad bowl, or simile of, of a mosaic. Um, now, now, the problem with that image, I think, is uh, uh, that it gives up on some form of common uh, uh, solidarity, on some form of uh, uh, common spirit too much. In a way that conjures up a society in which people just live next to each other in these separate communities, but actually have nothing in common. And in a way which makes me worried about whether democracies that really look like that would be able to sustain the kind of mutual solidarity they need in order to avoid the deepest pitfalls into which diverse societies have historically fallen. This might work in good times, but when there's tension, when somebody's really trying to incite hatred of these groups against each other, you need links between members of different communities. You need some sense of common identity in order to resist those kinds of demagogues. And so I worry that the salad bowl does not allow us to build these resilient, diverse democracies. And so I want to suggest a, a, a different metaphor, a new metaphor, but it's not a culinary metaphor. I don't know why people always reach with culinary metaphors in this context. Uh, and that's that of a public park. Because uh, for me, a public park expresses something important uh, about the free choices we should have, but also the kind of culture we should encourage. So, you know, after this event, if it's not too cold out there, uh, you know, we could go to a public park and continue this conversation with each other and say, we're not interested in that moment to meet anybody else because we're in the middle of a conversation where we want to continue, not interested in meeting other people. Right? But we could also go on a sunny day and have a barbecue and perhaps our kids start playing with the kids of, of a group next door and perhaps we're going to start exchanging some food and we're going to have a conversation, we're going to make new friends, we're going to make new connections with people who we didn't already know before we entered the public park. Both of those are legitimate choices. There's no rule in the park that says you have to do one or you can't do the other. Something similar is true in a liberal democratic society. 
It's perfectly appropriate, perfectly fine for citizens to say, for example, I grew up in a, 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 a very strong religious community. I want to devote my life uh, to respecting this community and to being a very faithful person. And I'm not very interested in talking to people outside the community. Most of my life I'm going to spend within the confines of this community. Perfectly legitimate choice to make within a free, pluralistic society. But if everybody made that choice, there would be something lost. In a helpful, vibrant society, there has to be a minimum number of people who make the choice to go out and forge new connections to get to know people from other groups, to start a business together perhaps, to have some kind of venture with each other, perhaps even to marry somebody from another group. We need a minimum of those kind of social interconnections for the society to be attractive and vibrant and resilient. So that leads me to a third kind of uh, issue, which is that of uh, the debate we've had for the last decades over the nature of patriotism and nationalism, whether those are positive things to be embraced or negative things to worry about. Now, uh, you know, as a German Jew, patriotism or nationalism do not come naturally to me. Um, and when I was young, uh, I thought that uh, we should overcome this entirely. But I've changed my mind about that. I've changed my mind because I've come to realize through reading history that historically patriotism has been one of the forces that allows us to enlarge the circle of human sympathy uh, beyond the family and the village, beyond the same ethnicity, beyond the same religion. But I've also come to change my mind about it because I've seen over the last 20 years that where decent people and moderate politicians didn't speak to patriotism, it was the worst kinds of people who came in and used the incredibly powerful symbolism of a nation for their nefarious ends. And so I think of patriotism as a half-domesticated animal that's gonna go, go wild and destroy a lot of things if it's stoked by the wrong people. And we have to be engaged in the never-ending attempt to domesticate it as best we can. But that leaves a question as to how to domesticate it. What form that patriotism should take? And roughly speaking, there's uh, a notion that I'd reject, which is that of ethnic nationalism. Right? It's a notion that says that who is a true Canadian is defined by membership in some particular ethnic or religious group, and for obvious reasons, I find that to be uh, dangerous and unattractive. There's a second notion, which I think has an important role to play, which was what I believed for a long time, which is a civic and constitutional patriotism, a patriotism that says what it is to be Canadian, for example, is to share a certain set of political values like tolerance and so on. I think that is an important element of a healthy patriotism, but I don't think that it's enough because when most people talk about being proud to be Canadian or loving Canada, they don't talk about political institutions. You know, you all came out on a very nice evening to, to, to hear me talk about politics. That makes you fundamentally weird. <laughs> that makes you fundamentally unlike most of your fellow citizens. And I think we have to recognize that most people, when they think about the love of country, they don't think about politics in the first instance. What we do think about is the beauty of Toronto over from here, perhaps the beauty of the, of the prairies and the countryside in Canada. They think of um, the sights and sounds and smells of their country. They think about some of the cultural scripts that uh, govern how we interact with each other. They might think of you know, celebrities and athletes and TikTok stars. Um, and that to me is an appreciation of a living, breathing, everyday culture. A culture which may be rooted in the past, but which is dynamic and which today, certainly in a place like Toronto, in a very natural way, bears the mark of the influence of all of those different ethnic and cultural and religious groups of people who have their origins all over the world. And so I think that we should add a second element to our patriotism, not just a civic and constitutional patriotism, that too, but also a cultural patriotism uh, based in appreciation for our naturally diverse everyday cultures. Um, I could talk a lot more about uh, uh, some of the policies we could adopt and so on. I'm sure that Sanjay and some of the others of you will uh, push me on that, but uh, let me end by 
putting this project into conversation with some of the other stuff I've worked on, because I'm somebody who was very worried about the state of democracy. He was one of the first to warn about the dangers that authoritarian populists pose to democracy. And that was a pretty pessimistic message. And now here I am with a more optimistic message. How do those two things fit together? Um, I think when we look at the politics of many countries, these threats to democracy persist. There's some hopeful signs that perhaps the star of some of these politicians is starting to fade. I think the midterms in the United States a couple of days ago are one of those hopeful signs. But that threat is going to continue to be very present, very real for a long time. In the short and midterm, I'm very worried about the stability of our democratic institutions. But that shouldn't blind us to the fact that when we actually look at what the depth of these societies is like, and what happens away from the capital, away from parliament, away from um, uh, the House of Commons and away from Congress, uh, people are tolerant, people are able to appreciate each other, uh, people are building societies that are much more naturally um, influenced by uh, the many talents and, and, and many origins that people in our societies uh, bring to the table. And I think that uh, we can hold those two thoughts in, in our heads at the same time. The concern about what's going on in the realm of high politics and the partisanship and the polarization and the threat of these populists, but also the real improvements we've made in our societies. And if we want the great experiment to succeed, we need to be able to embrace a vision of a future that most people would actually be excited to live in, in which most people can say, I see the kind of place that there would be for me in that society. And it doesn't pit me against the other groups. It isn't a zero-sum competition. It's a country in which all of us would be excited to live. And that's, I think, our task, to fight for that kind of vision. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for an uh, incredibly eloquent, wide-ranging talk, just like your books. A um, lot of questions you could ask. I want to start with, I mean, you divided your talk into three sections. Why is it so hard to build diverse democracies? Why should we be optimistic? And then the principles and policies we might embrace to create this society. So if you start, why is it so hard? So you talk about a number of things, you know, the sort of inherent tendency we have to form groups, and the book is actually full of uh, examples of this, besides the ones that Yasha mentioned, it was very, another funny one about, you know, a group of students who were put into different groups of, uh, do you like a Kandinsky, do you like a Klee? And there were certain, uh, you know, group effects and something like that too. But of course, in our society today, I mean, I'm really struck by, and it'll, it varies from which country we look at, but I think of the ones I know best, um, so I think Britain in particular, for instance, or Canada, a lot of the conflicts, particularly over language, religion, uh, certain cultural differences, it's a certain reckoning in the moment today, which is a reckoning of the colonial past of our countries. Right? So in this country with indigenous peoples, in Britain with the colonies, and the post-colonials moment, and all these immigrants came back in France, perfect example, right? Mm. So how do you think about that? Because there, there are great asymmetries of power, and there are great inequalities of wealth and status. And as you're saying, these things are changing, um, and that's really important to, to recognize as you do, and to put out there. But, you know, I, I, it's a very complicated issue. But change is happening, and yet for some it's not happening fast enough. I mean, that's one reason why we sort of see, as you're saying, a lot of friends on the left saying, things are not changing quickly enough. Mm. It's too slow, it's too gradual, it's too piecemeal, particularly when we profess all these ideals of equality. Um, you know, another reason is, I think it's a generational effect. My father, who came as a refugee to this country, um, probably expected discrimination and racism. I who was not born here but grew up here, um, was less tolerant of it because I was told that I belonged here. But I did experience it time to time. 
My son, who happens to be born in the United States but now lives here, is probably the least tolerant of it. So that, I mean, another way of putting this is saying, over time, one of the reasons why, there's sort of good reasons and bad reasons for this. One is that, on the one hand, change is not happening fast enough. On the other hand, you're right, change is happening. And the reason people are more upset about change not even happening more quickly is because they actually believe in these ideals even more. So mm -hmm. any, any experience of discrimination or racism mm. is intolerable. How do you th think about that? Yeah, um, I mean, that, that's a great question uh, and has many facets, so let me try and hit on some of them. And if I miss one, you should, you should push me. Um, uh, I mean, first of all, I do think that the hardest thing that diverse societies need to do is to deal with the long-lasting effects of past forms of what I call hard domination in the book. Um, so in a way, uh, you know, in the United States, the hardest problem is not immigration. The hardest problem is how do you rectify the compound uh, uh, disadvantage that African Americans uh, face because of centuries of slavery and another you know, 100, 150 years of significant discrimination even after the end of slavery. Right? Um, and, and that's a much tougher problem. Uh, in a similar way, uh, you know, it's easier for a society like the United Kingdom to deal with immigrants from all over the world, I mean, including Ghana and, and so on. Well, Ghana's a bad example, but <laughs> you know, all kinds of, all kinds of things, ra rather than sort of the many people who are in the country who uh, come from countries that are colonized by Britain, because their legacy is just much more complicated. And, um, and, and so I agree with you that that, that is a fundamental uh, set of challenges that diverse societies have to deal with. Um, now, even there, I think there's some good news. So when you look, for example, at African Americans in the United States, uh, that is undoubtedly the group that suffers the most continued disadvantage. Uh, but Donald Trump was wrong in 2016 when he uh, said, supposedly directed to black voters, vote for me, what, do you what the hell do you have to lose? You know, your neighborhoods are hell and, you know, you have nothing. That's simply not an accurate description of what life is like for the great majority of African Americans today. Um, and so I talk in the book about uh, the fact that the median African American today has a white collar job, lives in a suburb rather than uh, either sort of deprived rural area in the south, as it might historically have been the case, or in some kind of blighted inner city neighborhood, as somebody like Donald Trump might imagine. Um, they have, uh, I know that sounds quaint in Canada, but they have uh, state, uh, they have employer-sponsored health insurance, which is often a sign of a high-quality job in the United States, right? Um, and as I was saying earlier, uh, they are actually more optimistic about the future and believe more in the American dream um, than, uh, than white Americans do. Um, and, and so, again, there are, there's real problems there, but there's also significant progress that's been made, and we need to hold those two thoughts in our mind at the same time. When you look at a society like the United Kingdom, um, I think it's interesting that there is renewed contestation over the imperial past. And Britain is a country that really hasn't dealt very much with its imperial past. I mean, certain historians and academics and so on, but in public debate, there really hasn't been that much contestation over it. Certainly less than uh, uh, Germany has dealt with its past, less, I think, than America has dealt with its past in some ways. Um, and it's healthy that that debate is now getting going. But I'm not sure to what extent it structures political conflict lines today. Certainly not when it comes to high politics, when it comes to parliamentary politics. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, actually, when you look at who votes for whom, what's striking is that uh, at this point, uh, mostly Muslim immigrants from, from Pakistan uh, or from what today is India uh, tend to vote quite clearly for labor for a variety of reasons. But at this point, a majority of Hindu immigrants uh, to Britain, or a majority of Hindus in Britain, even if they're not immigrants, tend to vote for the Conservative Party. Mm. And of course, Rishi Sunak, the new prime minister, is a very visible encapsulation of that, but he's not an outlier. And according to many polls now, a majority of Hindus in Britain actually vote for the Conservative Party. There By the way, they also supported Brexit. Yeah, yeah. And by the way, in Germany, a uh, majority of descendants of immigrants now vote for right of center parties. Um, so, you know, the, the, the politics of this is really complicated. Um, and so I, I'll say something provocative to you about your own family, and that may be untrue. Uh, 
um, but I'd love to hear your reaction to it. Um, so I agree with you that often there is this mechanism where the first generation is just grateful for the opportunities they have, grateful for the relative good treatment they get, and they, they take it in stride, but of course some people are going to be bigoted, it's to be expected. And then the next generation becomes less tolerant of it, and perhaps the next generation after that is even more angry about it. And I agree with you that that's in many ways a positive sign. It's a sign of saying, hey, I believe the values of a society, now you better live up to it. Um, but I wonder whether it is also a class thing, mm. whether it's also uh, sort of the more uh, uh, immigrant families succeed and the more they're a, a member of a very educated class of people, the more angry they are about those kinds of things. Because again, when you look at uh, opinion in general, it doesn't seem to me to be the case, certainly in the United States, which I know better, and in Britain and in Germany and so on, um, that most descendants of immigrants do feel that the society has betrayed them and vote for left-wing parties and push for these progressive causes. There's obviously some who do, but in a majority, they often vote for right-wing political parties and they're deeply patriotic and, um, you know, they actually are quite happy with their societies. So, so I guess I wonder how representative that is in that sense. Yeah, no, that's a good point. I, mean, I think class is very important. And I think it will probably vary across ethnic communities. I mean, I think I was probably generalizing from a very specific experience of very fascinating studies of Indian Americans, uh, so in the United States, and that's where this generational survey hmm. yielded these kinds of results. You talked about um, the, the paradox of our democracies, right? There's a logic of numbers in democracies about majorities and minorities, that's how you win power. Um, in the book, Yasha talks about a particular um, regime uh, made famous by a political scientist named R.N. Leipart called consociationalism, clunky word, but it basically was a form of, uh, it's a type of political regime, for those who haven't come across this phrase, which grants collective rights, veto powers, collective representation to distinct communities, whether they're based on ethnicity or language or religion. So the Netherlands, Belgium are sort of paradigmatic cases as a way of sharing power in deeply divided societies, right? So you share power in deeply divided societies by, um, cl through collective rights, through group representation in the corridors of power. And as you show in the book, this can work for a while, but it can also actually institutionalize fragmentation um, and create deadlock. So there's a lot of work of, um, as you know, in political science about different kinds of power sharing mechanisms. There are different types of democracies. Electoral systems vary from first past the post to proportional. Parliamentary regimes are seen to be more conducive to sharing power than presidential, because there's one president, right? And whereas prime ministers, as we know, change <laughs> even within parties, cabinets uh, can Sometimes be Sometimes 17 times in a year, probably. Yeah, in Britain or, you know, uh, right? And, and then there's, of course, federalism is another power sharing uh, system. There's different varieties, Germany, United States, Canada, India. Very. So tell us a little bit more about how you think about that. What types of democratic institutions? You talked in the book about how consociationalism was promising for a while, but then encountered these problems. What kinds of democratic institutions do you think facilitate power sharing in a deeply diverse democracy? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, uh, so, so, so let me start by explaining a little bit the point that I make about consociationalism in, in the book. So, um, uh, you know, what strikes me about this theory is that Aaron Leipart comes up with it. Uh, I think the sort of really influential book he publishes on it is published in something like 1969 or perhaps 1970. And he basically says, look, in a society like Lebanon, um, where you have this long-standing competition between different religious groups, uh, Shias, Sunnis, and Maronite Christians, as well as a few others in that case. Um, you know, you need to keep the peace somehow. And the best way of doing that is to reduce the stakes of politics. And you do that by saying, A, you're always going to be sharing power. So um, the president is always going to be a Shia, and the prime minister is always going to be a Sunni, and the speaker of a parliament is always going to be a Maronite Christian. So everybody's always at the table. And B, some of the most important laws that determine how you lead your life are not going to be based on whether you're a Lebanese citizen or not. They're going to be based on whether you're Shia or a Sunni or a Maronite Christian. So 
um, the laws governing your marriage, the laws governing your divorce, the laws governing um, your education are going to be made by those religious communities. Now, I think there's a bunch of problems with that. One of them is that uh, there's no real democratic way of doing that. And so as a result, you're actually subject to these religious authorities, right? Sunnis and Shias, when they feel that, or minor Christians, when they feel that the laws governing divorce are unfair to women, they don't actually have a clear democratic mechanism by which they can contest that. That seems really wrong. The second problem you get is that you really bake in these identities. I have a, a, a Lebanese acquaintance um, who I ran into randomly recently uh, in the street in New York, um, uh, who is uh, a, a Sunni and he married a Shia, and they could not do that in Lebanon. They did, but the state didn't recognize the marriage for many, many years. So what, what, what Lebanese people often do, which is ironically what Israelis also do, is to go to Cyprus. Uh, to get married there, and then they can kind of recognize, get it recognized as a foreign wedding. But within the country, there's no actual facility for members of these different groups to marry each other because that messes up the system. Because for consociationalism to work, the leaders of each group have to have complete control of the group, and when people don't fit into any of the groups, that's a problem. And so uh, in the short run, that might work to keep the peace, but in the long run, you actually... Uh, bake in these identities more and more deeply and it becomes impossible to have any form of mutual solidarity. And so for me the big irony of this solution is that uh, Aaron Leipard says this is how we solve it in 1970 and what happens a couple of years later a really terrible, protracted and bloody civil war breaks out. And so I think we should be a little bit careful about that solution. Now I'm not going to, you know, there's a lot of different things discussed proportional representation versus majoritarian political systems, federalism versus more centralized, there's all kinds of questions. But what I will say is, um, is two things. One is uh, we need a political system in which we insist that the rights and the duties you have as a citizen depends on your citizenship status, not on your membership of some subnational group. That can retain respect for groups, that can be uh, mechanisms of consultation where there's uh, you know, perfectly appropriate to have spokespeople for particular groups that are often invited to debates about laws that affect them and so on. There can be all of these sort of informal consultation mechanisms. But I think when, when power is formally devolved to these groups within society, I think that is really, really concerning. In some extreme circumstances, but maybe the only thing you can do. I'm not saying that there's not some post-Civil War society where, where that's the best you can do. But I think for a society like Canada, you should be very, very skeptical of those kinds of things. The second has less to do with institutions, but it has to do with the norms of a society. And I thought originally you were perhaps going in that direction of a question. Um, in the United States, uh, this theory became incredibly popular 15 or 20 years ago, which basically said uh, that there's a rising demographic majority for Democrats. And it was written by friends of mine, Rui Teixeira and others, who were trying to give hope to Democrats in the years when George W. Bush and Republicans seemed really dominant. And they were saying, hey, that's good news because white people usually vote for the Republican Party in greater numbers. Non-white people usually vote for Democrats in greater numbers. The share of a population that's non-white is growing. So over time, you're going to get a majority. It was a little more complicated than that, but that's how it was read by campaign strategists and politicians and so on. Right? Um, and Republicans agreed with this theory. They hated it, they were worried about it, but they also came to think, hang on a second, as this demographic change is going to happen, we are going to be locked out of power. And so this became the shared empirical basis mm -hmm. for American politics for a long time. Now that has been a disaster in two ways. It has been a disaster empirically, and it's been a disaster normatively. Why is it a disaster empirically? Um, because uh, you simply can't fast forward how people vote by decades in these demographic categories. You go back to the 1960s, Irish Americans were one of the most reliable voter blocs for the Democratic Party. By 2016, they were one of the most reliable voter groups for the Republicans, and they helped elect Donald Trump. In 2020, the reason why Joe Biden won against Donald Trump is that he significantly increased the share of a vote 
compared to Hillary Clinton among white voters. The reason why Donald Trump was competitive in 2020 is that he significantly increased his share of the vote among every non-white demographic, among African Americans, among Asian Americans, and particularly among Latinos. And by the way, on Tuesday, even as Democrats held on pretty well across the country, Republicans for the first time gained a 90% Latino district in the south of Texas, and they won a majority of the vote in Miami-Dade County. So we simply can't fast forward and know how demographic blocks are going to vote 20 or 30 years from now. And normatively, that is a very positive thing. Because I don't want to live in a society where I can look into the audience and I know who you're voting for by looking at the color of your skin. And if we want to really endanger our democracy, we're going to get to a point where politics can be understood as a competition between whites on the one side and people of color on the other side. That would be a disaster for our politics. That would make it incredibly high stakes, incredibly dangerous. So actually the best piece of news about American politics over the last 10, 15 years is the relative depolarization of the American electorate by race. Knowing what ethnicity you have today tells me much less about who you voted for than it would have done 10 or 15 years ago. And that is a really, really good piece of news. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because as you say, you know, we, have multiple and we have multiple identities, overlapping identities, and our social identities are not automatically our political yeah. partisan identities. Um, I want to ask one more question, and we'll open it up. Um, there's so many to ask from. Um, you okay. spoke about I'm going to Actually, pour myself a glass of water while yeah. you uh, ponder which question to ask. There's too many good questions to ask. Um, let me ask, uh, look, in, in the book, uh, you, you sort of end the book um, saying, what principles and policies should we <clears throat> embrace? Uh, and you say we have these two sort of culinary <laughs> paradigms, melting pot, salad bowl. They both have virtues. They both have problems. You put forward this idea of, of the park which is very inviting um, as a space uh, in the way in which you, know, you describe a park at its best. Because, of course, parks can also become zones of exclusion, as we know, right? So, but a, a park, a public park that's genuinely public, open to all. You also talk, as you mentioned in your talk, the difference between civic patriotism and cultural patriotism. So maybe that's the question I want to sort of end on. I see how, why everyday culture is something that is very important and can bind us. Um, the social conventions, the cultural scripts, uh, the sort of things we love, the quirks of our, our countries and our societies. Um, but I had sort of two questions to push back a little bit. Oh, and, and, I, and I'm not saying you do this in the book, but I just want to hear you more say, talk more about it. So civic patriotism, you know, venerating the Constitution, uh, is, too, is too cold, too rational. It doesn't sort of move us, although it can. You know, I, I've focused a lot of my time on India, and in the last mm. few years, there's been a great assault on Indian democracy, and what do those who are trying to protect it against Hindu nationalism do? They hold rallies where they read the preamble to the Constitution. They sing the anthem. Mm. Uh, uh, they, they wave the flag. Uh, this is ours. We reclaim these symbols of nationalism. But on the cultural patriotism, the sort of everyday, here, I think, you know, as we know in Canada, United States, Britain, France, I mean, so many countries, one of the issues you said in your talk a lot, and look at Toronto, it's this sort of exemplifies this kind of diverse democracy that you celebrate, right? Well, you always call it flat of a host a little bit. Yeah. You? New York, London. This is the question. So these are the cities, mm. right? The cities are these places which bring together many different types of people. And that is why they tend to be more liberal. Both those who are minorities and there want to vote for parties that protect that space, and those who are part of an older population, like you said, our neighbors, friends, coworkers, and they get to know each other. But we've seen, as we see this very geographic or sexual segmentation from Germany to France to Britain, where it's particularly in the rural parts of our countries, which are less, which are more homogenous, ethnically, racially which, and this is your previous book about populism, right? Mm -hmm. One of the sites, one of the sources of this is that you're more likely to, to vote for a populist party 
if you live in a part of the country that both is facing more economic stagnation, feels more cut off from the, from the cosmopolitan cities, the liberal elites, um, and actually you encounter fewer people, mm. right, of other communities. And so the, the cultural common sense that you talk about, which is very important, the cultural common sense in Toronto, or New York, or London, or Paris, might be quite different from these more provincial towns or rural sectors where, yeah. let me put it this way, the, the cultural patriotism, which you think is a great important glue, which I can see how it is, and it changes in the cities because they're more diverse, more dynamic, might have a very strong older ethnic basis, right, in mm. other parts of the country. And that what's happening is that there isn't a singular cultural patriotism, right? It, too, is being fragmented in our societies. So how do you think about that divide? And That's a really interesting question. I mean, it, it made me think um, whether there's a great poll to be done, which probably is hard to carry out. Um, and I'll explain what that is in a moment. So, uh, you know, it's true that there is this very clear geographical pattern to who votes, in particular for these sort of far-right populist parties. Um, and, uh, uh, and the more rural the area is, the more true that becomes. In fact, even when you look at a small town, um, uh, you know, in some uh, state uh, in the United States, for example, people in the core of that town, even if it's a pretty small town, are much less likely to vote for the sort of far-right populace than people around it, right? Um, so there's a very clear and very interesting set of geographic patterns uh, where the support for populace is mediated by those geographic concentrations. Now, what would be interesting, actually, is to look at, uh, you know, no place is devoid of diversity today, at least in Canada and the United States, right? Even if you go to uh, Iowa or you go to Saskatchewan or something like that, you actually do have a significant number of uh, ethnic minorities, um, immigrants, and so on, even in these sort of rural areas. It would be interesting to see how they vote, mm -hmm. right? So sort of is this a rural versus urban thing or is this an ethnic thing? If you sort of look at the control variables, which actually is, uh, ends up driving it. And I think part of it is going to be rural, urban, in a multi-ethnic way. Um, because part of it, I think most of what drives this geographic divide is not those cultural differences, uh, for maybe part of it, it's the sense that many rural areas have of uh, we don't have the same economic development, we don't have the same opportunities, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, things have really gone badly for us. And, uh, you know, one thing I often think about is you know, if you made a decision in 1970, 1975 about where to base your family, you know, you're, you're 25 years old, you're about to have kids, and you're thinking, where do I buy a home that I'm going to be able to raise the kids in and, you know, stay for till the end of my life? It really wouldn't have been clear that you would want to go to L.A., Chicago, New York, or whether you would have wanted to go to a mid-sized town in Michigan, Iowa, Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. Many reasons at the time to go for a mid-sized town in those states. Today, the answer would be very clear. I mean, may have whatever personal preferences, but in terms of where's the economic opportunity, where's the educational opportunity, um, where is there even less crime, less drug dependency, less all kinds of things. The cities are doing much, much, much better than those mid-sized towns. And I think a lot of what drives this vote for populists in those areas is that sense of economic decline. Mm -hmm. You know, hey, in Toronto, things might be get, get, getting better for you. Where we are, things are not getting better, they're getting worse, and we're angry about it. Right. And that's a kind of, you know, somewhat rational basis. Um, I do take your point for that, obviously, that everyday uh, diverse culture is more real in Toronto than it is in, in, in smaller towns and villages. Um, uh, uh, across the country. I think there's two things to be said about that. The first is that it's a question of stage. Um, that the shock in Toronto of, oh my God, suddenly there's so many people from all over the world came a few decades ago. And there's a kind of counter-reaction against it where that then subsides. Mm -hmm. um, and perhaps uh, some other areas are still more in the middle of it. Um, and the other uh, is, you know, I, 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 I'm going to be a little bit optimistic about the ability of rural areas as well to build that culture. And that, that may take a little bit of time. We may not, some areas may not quite be there yet. Um, but, you know, there's a Canadian show that expresses that quite nicely. I know it's a little silly and idealistic, but, you know, a, a little mosque on the prairie mm. um, is one kind of encapsulation of it. 
But I experienced that in the village that I'm in in, in Italy, um, where I spend a lot of time. Uh, where you know the views of people are not as cosmopolitan as they are in, in, in Toronto and so on. But there are people there who have a background of migration. Uh, there are often non-white immigrants, Muslim immigrants, uh, things that in the Italian context, you know, people have a little bit of fear about to start off with. Um, but, you know, the kids go to school and they become friends with, with their kids and, uh, you know, they work in the local shops and the local whatever and they get to know each other. And all of the kind of forms of intergroup contact, which I think drives that increase in tolerance, that reduction of fear, that other who seems so different actually turns out to be somebody I know and, 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 and somebody who helps me to reconceptualize what I think of a group in general. Those mechanisms take place very strongly in these, in these rural areas as well. Um, and even though we're not as far along, I'd be pretty optimistic about the ability of those places to make that same transformation. No, I completely agree with you. I mean, I, I grew up in, uh, in Cape Breton. I was the only, I was certainly the only Indian child in my school of 500. I was probably one of the one or two only non-white children. Wanted to be Guy Lafleur when I was a kid at five years old. Um, don't look like, I don't look like him, didn't play like him. Uh, but there was, um, you're right, there, those places have changed. I mean, certainly even in this country, the census was just put out two weeks ago. It was quite remarkable showing that a lot of new immigrants are going actually to the smaller yeah, cities. Huh? And that's actually driven, as you say, it's dynamic because the cost of living in big cities like Toronto, Vancouver right. is so expensive, it's driving people out. And so we're seeing a changing demographic in these places.